So I'm a computer scientist from birth. I was uh, uh, developed uh, uh, an interest in computers very early and was uh, a student at MIT as an undergraduate, uh, Stanford as a, getting a PhD in, also in computer science uh, with John Mitchell was my advisor there at Stanford. Okay. The future, what do you think? <laughs> uh, the future is very exciting. There's a lot of prospects for very good uh, uh, augmentation of human capabilities for making the world better and making it a, a safer, more interesting, better place for people to live. I tend to be a, a devotee of Doug Engelbart's uh, point of view, uh, looking at the world as a place where uh, computers and systems and robots and things should be there to help augment human capabilities as opposed to have their own purpose or interest. So the particular question I ended my talk with was uh, what is the world's most urgent critical problem? And the answer to that would be to collectively improve our ability to solve urgent and critical problems. Give me some specifics as to you know, what you're talking about. So an example is uh, building uh, highly high-powered reasoning engines. So there are um, uh, uh, AI is a broad technique, and I was asked here to talk about AI. Uh, there are many aspects of it, but the one that we're focused on is automated reasoning, automated deduction. So how do you take a propositional formula and decide whether it's satisfiable? How do you take a first order logic formula and decide whether it's valid, whether it's true or not? So those are questions traditionally from theorem proving and mathematics and sort of uh, uh, Aristotle thought about some of these problems of, uh, of logic, but we've been building automated systems to reason about those. And that is entertaining in its own, uh, just as a game to build, a, what, how can we build a theorem prover that can prove a, such a theorem automatically? but its application to building better, more reliable systems, to analyze systems that already exist, to help those systems understand and react to their environment is what's the, the best use of that technology. The singularity seems to be the big, the big word going mm -hmm. around here. Mm -hmm. um, tell, explain in some simple terms how AI plays into that. Well, so the, I don't happen to believe in a single singularity. So I think there may be multiple singularities of, uh, of interest. And so the, the, it, it depends on one's perspective and one has to be crisp about the definition of singularity before you can even talk about whether there would be one or multiple ones. But the, the you know, coming out of the trees and walking, you know, developing uh, opposable thumbs is a uh, singularity of a kind. Uh, the printing press, Ray uh, spoke about some of these in his address of events where it really changed the world in a way where the majority of the population before the, that event would not be able to keep up and understand all the effects of that, of that change in the world that occurred when a printing press became available, as an example. Uh, the singularity people are talking about at this conference uh, tends to focus on uh, the advent of strong AI, an artificial intelligence that would go on and, and, and go beyond the ability of any human to keep up. And I happen not to believe that that is, is in the short-term future, that there is uh, prospects, though, for artificial intelligence that greatly amplifies a small team, maybe an individual, uh, maybe a small team of people to really go and change the world, to really uh, augment their capability to invent new capabilities that make them even more powerful, to develop more technologies and move even faster into the future. And this kind of uh, spiral of, of advances can start to accelerate very greatly, but in my view, with humans in the loop. And so in that sense, the singularity will happen as multiple steps. There'll be multiple singularities of individuals and small teams inventing things that revolutionize some aspect of life, some aspect of how technologies are developed in the future. Uh, the World Wide Web, the mouse kind of graphical interface are examples of things that really changed how, you, how people spend their days now and also accelerated the ability of other people to develop other technologies and to share their knowledge and more effectively collaborate to build new technologies. What, what's in the works? What, what, what can we expect to see sort of short term? So short term, uh, there are uh, many advances of, of great interest. Uh, the SRI International is uh, leading an effort called CALO for cognitive assistant that learns and observes. So this is an office uh, automation kind of application. We're developing uh, in partnership with other universities, with many of the top universities and AI and learning researchers around the world, are working on this project to try to make uh, our life in the office slightly better. So can it read my email and, and compartmentalize my email already? So people often have different e email boxes. Can I sort the email that comes from this project and that project and separate them 
reliably. It turns out that Kalo is already able, better able to do that email sorting than the human is, even the human user themselves. Even when Kalo is not told explicitly, this is what this email is about and this is the project, it's reading the email and from simple uh, analysis of the email, able to do a better job than the human user themselves at categorizing email. So that's something that, that isn't there in a commercial product yet, but there in the research lab uh, back at SRI, we have that working. And so I think in the near term, those kinds of things will be available where you have a much smarter way to interact with email systems, not just blocking spam, but prioritizing, categorizing, already taking some actions on the basis of it, scheduling meetings as an example of many emails I get are about scheduling phone calls, scheduling meetings. There's nothing wrong with that, but it would be much better if I could have that handled much more automatically than today. You said that, that your view isn't one big singularity, several s smaller ones. Right. Why does your view differ from the people that say it's going to be one big thing? Uh, it, it may be just a question of timing that over the long term that there will be some strong AI that comes. I can't see that yet, so I don't, I don't look that direction too much as my, as my day job, but I, I'm looking into these shorter term things that in seven years, in ten years, that there are these revolutions that will happen in some domain, but it doesn't revolutionize things to the point that one cannot predict beyond it, that even the humans in the loop of inventing it couldn't predict beyond. That is, I don't see that. So that's a difference. There are those who believe that uh, the development of strong AI is very, very close, that we will have AI able to invent and improve its own ability to reason uh, uh, in the short term. And that, that's something that, that if, if you believe in, then you believe that as soon as that gets going, it will then take off on an exponential curve of improvement, of improving its own capabilities. Without a human in the loop, you can imagine that uh, accelerating almost without limit. And that's the big singularity. And this is the hard takeoff versus soft takeoff that Werner talked about this morning. Uh, there's a great deal of question about how that really unfolds. And what I'm basically advocating, or I guess suggesting what I see from here, looks more like a soft uh, takeoff of these things, where more and more improvements in many, many other areas, as opposed to one giant uh, break in the environment where this AI comes available and in you know, 100 hours later, the world has changed in a way we cannot recognize anymore. Is, is the future going to be a good place or a bad place? The future is a great place. The future is very exciting. There's, uh, things are improving dramatically on almost every dimension. So the uh, technologies of energy uh, efficiency and energy extraction mean that some of the, the limits on growth that people have talked about of available energies running out, uh, population growth, uh, uh, exceeding all bounds as, an, as another exponential you could worry about also seems to be uh, something that seems to be contained, that as the uh, population becomes more educated, their, their birth rate tends to come down, and in fact there are those who predict that the population will start to flatten out. So the, the, the usual doom and gloom about the future has to do with running out of critical resources. Energy is a key one, water is another one. There are many uh, topics that are very important, but the fortunate Fortunately for us, we have an ability to uh, invent new technologies that greatly reduce the amount of energy we need for accomplishing some task. The population is not growing without uh, bound on the exponential. It seems to be a more sigmoidal kind of development of the pop world population. If one projects out, uh, even in, as far as I can see, the future doesn't have doom and gloom unless a, a, a catastrophe that I cannot predict now happens. That always could happen. That a, an asteroid slams into the earth, there's a plague of unimaginable uh, horrific nature comes about. These can occur and there are spike events like that, but no one can predict those uh, and if we could predict them we might be able to address them. So the future without those disasters looks very bright. Having greater technology at our fingertips, more power available to everyone. So everyone improving their ability to uh, address health concerns, to control their environment in better and stronger ways than they are able to do today. Is there anything that we have control over um, that we need to be wary of, need to be a little afraid of? There are many things. There's many, the world is a dangerous place. Even though the future is very exciting, the world is a dangerous place. So driving a car, you're always uh, just a couple of seconds away from a car accident that could occur. So certainly the world is a, is a dangerous place. 
but automation can actually, the future will bring automation that can reduce the risks and make the world a better place to live because I can have collision avoidance systems built into my car. I can have uh, uh, predictive techniques that would help me understand where's the best place to drive, the safest place to drive, the fastest to get between this location and that one. Instead of just this is the way I always drive and there's an accident there today and that, has, that therefore it's jammed up and that leads to a higher probability I get in a fender bender because there's more congestion. That's an example of sort of cascading failures that we might be able to avoid if we had better recognition, better knowledge of uh, what was currently going on in the environment than we have today. What happened we talked about that you think is important? <laughs> uh, education. So a key part of this, again, human in the loop, since I'm a big advocate of there's going to be a human in the loop in the, all these developments, we have to make sure we have really smart, well-educated people that know what uh, is happening around them. They know the world. They know the developments that have occurred recently. So the development of Wikipedia, as an example, is something that's a great information sharing resource. Uh, unfortunately, not everybody has access to that. So there's access to these things, education in terms of just getting access to resources like Wikipedia, but uh, also the ability to understand the, the whole process of science, the whole process of engineering. These are topics that are not usually well taught and uh, and I, I would say a fraction of the population currently understands what science is about and what engineering is about, even though I see those as very fundamentally important to the future of the whole society. So the, the key problem is making sure that we have an educated population that is empowered to make their own decisions because they have the knowledge and reasoning capability to make those decisions. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have anything? Uh, I don't think so. Everything's good. Is this really about Doug? I mean, she, uh, uh, should I say something about Doug Engelbart and his particular work or anything like that? Sure. Or are you just it other be people? Okay. Uh, Doug Engelbart is a great inspiration for many of the, the advances of the modern world. What people consider recent advances were actually made by him and his, his colleagues like Bill English and the other great researchers that came together in that team uh, back in the 70s and the 60s before that. So the demonstration, the very famous demonstration of the mouse at the Fall Joint Computer Consortium at the end of the 1960s really demonstrated the modern world. And the techniques that they used to develop that are repeatable. The great uh, ability of a team to come together and use, develop new tools and then use those tools to develop new things is something that Doug and his group developed and implemented and has unfortunately not been used widely since then. If we could get more teams working like that today, the world would accelerate even better, even faster, sooner.